Hello, everyone. As I see you um, coming through the virtual um, door, um, a very, um, I was going to say warm welcome, but it's quite chilly at the moment. Um, and I think for some of you, it's a very wet welcome. Um, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Thanks for being nice and prompt. Um, for those, that, and I recognize some people here, um, for those that have been before, um, if you just want to um, um, go in the chat, uh, Um, if you can phonetically spell your name so I can get it right, uh, and then maybe your role, uh, your location, you could say the weather or what you're hoping to get today. Um, if we do location, we'll play who's the furthest away. Um, we've got Sheffield at the moment, so our wonderful speaker, Melissa, is winning that. And I'll, I'll, it'll be free advertising. I'll call out your name and your organization if you go on there. I appreciate for some people um, being on screen is not the most suitable or comfortable thing, and that's fine, but it's always lovely to see some friendly faces. So I can see Lauren, I'll give you a wave, and Lisa, I'll give you a wave. Latoya's got her screen on, but it's obviously hiding under the desk, so I'll give you half a wave, Latoya. Okay, I see um, Bex. Hi, good, good to see you. Uh, thank you. So in the chat, we got uh, Anisha. Thank you for phonetically spelling. Um, Singapore Dover Court International School. So, is that is it is it is it called Sing is that in Dover or is that in Singapore? So you're either a, a definite winner, uh, unless we've got someone from Australia. Um, we've got Emily Loughborough University. Hello, Emily. Matthew, after sales quality at Bentley Motors and Crew. Lovely to have you on board, Matthew. And I saw your my name is your going to do a my name is campaign, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, it is Singapore, so Anisha's got the winner. That's that game over. Um, got Lisa, thank you for changing lives, based in Gateshead, so that's most north, and Suki, the Open University, and based in Scotland, oh, so you're, you're now winning. Um, so um, it's nice to see people, you know, not just in, I call the London home counties, which a lot of events are, so it's, it's, it's great. Um, that's it. For those that have just come into the room, uh, as you can see, people are introducing themselves, so I can see Mushana, um, I'm the HR and volunteer lead at Camden Carers, um, Uh, we know you come to, uh, Camden come to a lot of our events, which is great in Kentish Town. Um, I love Camden. And Nicola Vale of Glamorgan, Council South Wales. So my connection with you is I'm going on holiday to Wales next year, Nicola, in South, in South Glamorgan. Um, I'm going for the weather, which you can promise, can't you? Um, so we'll start in a minute. Uh, it is lunchtime. So please feel free to you know have your lunch, your drinks, your soups, or whatever you need. You want it to be as relaxed as possible, Okay. Uh, I will mention again the event. We are recording this event, so for everyone, you know, um, you'll be able to sort of get a recording next week uh, for anything that you miss, or um, you know, if you just want to rehear or re-see. We've got Joanna from Open University in Milton Keynes. Um, uh, got Alona from Open University, or just jump mid Ulster. So that's I, I, I'm, um, that's in no uh, Northern Ireland. So um, fantastic. Um, Uh, Sharon, oh, hello, Sharon, of oh, Barbados. So, uh, oh, gosh, <laughs> I don't know what's further, Singapore or Barbados, so I do apologise. It's lovely to have you back, Sharon. So, actually, Sharon spoke at our last Race Andy event, uh, Race and Gender, which was very important. And got Ruth uh, from Leeds. Um, and we've got uh, Ellen uh, Equalities at Welsh Language, Fred Glamorgan. So, thank you all. Um, we've got, um, it's such a rich and wonderful subject matter this so we've got so much to share with you all so what we will do and thank you for being on time we will start now because i know your time is very very precious thank you so um this just a little teaser what do we see there and we'll come back that to later uh, that'll be shown at the end of the event okay so what do you see there Okay, so um, a big welcome to our second race and event. It's a brand new series taking a deeper look at intersectionality through the lens of race. Today's event is race and neurodiversity, and it's been requested by popular demand by the community, as well as it being Black History Month and ADHD Awareness Month. We're in the middle of, of Dyslexia Awareness Week, which just started, and next week is Dyspraxia Awareness Week. So again, if you haven't got them, and we've got a slide later, you can take a photo or screenshot of them. We're proud to bring you this new series, which is powered by our friends at law firm CMS, and we couldn't do it without their support. And we know we have some CMS colleagues joining us today, so a big shout out to you and thank you for joining us and your support. This series is more exclusive and intimate than some of our others, as it's exclusive for members and VIP guests. I'm Javid 
Thomas, co-founder of Race Quality Matters, along with Raj Chilsiani, uh, who is also the Chief Exec Officer of Executive Recruitment and Diversity Experts Green Park. Um, he said hello, he can't be uh, with us today. Uh, next slide, um, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, to help make our events more accessible, when registering, we do ask you for any accessibility arrangements we can try and offer to support. We do our best to meet, meet your needs. Please bear in mind we're a not-for-profit with limited sources. However, closed captioning is enabled in the main session. There is also a link in the chat for captioning during the virtual breakout rooms, and we'll share them again later, okay? The event is being recorded, uh, except for the breakout sessions. Uh, and REM members will be able to have access to it after the event. During the session, your sound is auto disabled, so we um, have minimal, minimal distraction uh, that we get in people's backgrounds. So please share any ideas and questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to respond to these. The chat will be extremely busy after the breakout session, so a heads up in advance in case you need to switch the sound off if you're utilizing accessibility tools. There could be a lot of pings. Next slide, please. In the next 75 minutes, we will all learn, explore and collaborate on intersectionality with a specific lens on race and neurodiversity. So we will keep things moving, but as normal, there'll be polls and some videos. You'll hear from three expert speakers who share their personal experiences of being neurodivergent and or neurodiverse and ethnically diverse, and their thoughts and ideas how you and your organizations can support your employees who are typically misunderstood and disadvantaged. There will be collaborative discussion groups and we'll finish by 1.45 and we have a game of Mythbusters halfway through it. Um, it's, instead of the ad break, we could get a sponsor. Um, and by um, attending, um, we'll hope you leave with 50 plus ideas that we collate from today's session uh, to support you all. Today's event will be sharing a lot of stats videos and resources there's a lot of stuff but you will get it all afterwards as well okay so we do appreciate we're, we're, we're trying to pack it all in um so you will get that everything after next slide uh please take care we do appreciate some of the topics or the discussions can be um upsetting or emotional for some people so please take a screenshot of this if you want or a photo we will share it after so this is some support you can get um, and they, they, here's some other support from organizations uh, that focus on neurodiversity. Again, we will share this with you afterwards, okay? Okay. Um, next slide, please. As you may hopefully know, um, but they're, they're, uh, for the new people here today, because I can see a lot of new names have joined, so welcome to you all, um, and welcome back to the others. Um, it, um, we're about providing tools, resources, and skills to make an impact on tackling race inequality in your organizations. We focus on what our community tells us is important to address at today's subject. We create concepts and solutions in collaboration with those with lived experience of racial inequality and our community of change makers. We also shine light on other solutions that make an impact. So just some of our solutions, um, and again, there's a link um, in the chat and we'll share them after. We've got It's Not Micro to tackle microaggressions. My name is, getting names right. Five day challenge. We've got a new one coming out for 2025. Tea break, safe space plus, and big promise. Next slide, please. And of course, we've got race quality week in February, where it's a micro five day challenge are perfect solutions for you to run. Um, we've got an event next week, uh, next month uh, to focus on that as well. Next slide, please. Uh, crucially, as you can see, all our solutions focus on making a significant impact, as you can see in the screen. It's all about impact. So it does make a real, real difference. So uh, please do um, do look into these. And and, and they're all available uh, for, for free, um, should you want. These solutions and resources, I said, are free. You can get how to do it right guides. But members can attend some of our workshops. Um, and you'll find information um, later on. Next slide. We are a not-for-profit, and this would not be possible without wonderful supporters, Green Park and Lloyds, who finally support us um, and our Race Equality Week. We also have, um, along with a collaboratory and lifetime vision supporter, BT, CMS, proud sponsor of today's events, Autotrader, HS2, Amy, and new partner, Direct Line Group, Edelman, and Network Rail. All these enable us to provide this for you. Next slide, please. 
So uh, for those um, um, who are new, we, we always kick off with an opening poll, say to nation. So it's all anonymous. It's just to get a sense of who's in the room and your experiences in the workplace uh, with regard to race and um, neurodiversity. So we'll give you sort of like a, a minute or so just to go through these questions. Thank you all for taking the time and completing the opening poll so we can now share the results with you. So here today, 65% identify as an ally, i.e. not ethnically diverse, and 35% ethnic diverse or appropriate equivalent. So um, yeah, um, a good mix there. Question two, what role do you play in your organization? So eight, so 20% of your senior leaders, 15% HR professionals, 25% DNI professionals, 11% are race network members, and 7% race network leads. And uh, 44% are other roles. So it's really good to have such a mix for this race and neurodiversity um, event. Question three, in your organization, what are you a member of? So 43% are members of a race network. 41% a disability or equivalent network. 25% other um, and 3% say we don't have networks. So it's great to see, um, you know, it's a race and neurodiversity events. So we've got a disability network representative here and race network representatives here, which is perfect. Um, question five, are you neurodivergent? So 26% um, is yes and diagnosed and 18% yes to undiagnosed. You know, to be, you don't need a piece of paper to be neurodivergent, okay? And then a further 19% saying not sure, which makes sort of 63%. So nearly two in three of us here today um, um, may be um, neurodivergent or will have the challenges uh, uh, neurodiversity brings us into the organisations. Question six, do you know someone else who is neurodivergent? So 83% saying yes, and a further 9% maybe, but under undiagnosed, that's 92% here, uh, believe we know someone who is neurodivergent. Question seven, do you or someone you know hide their disability work? And 48% saying yes, only 19% saying no. So um, the remainder 30% are not sure. And I guess that could be because people hide it so well, we don't know whether they are hiding it. So we could argue, you know, 80% here today uh, um, are aware that people are um, hiding the disability work. Do you know what masking is? So 85% saying yes, which is fantastic um, to hear and understand. So it helps us understand the challenges uh, or people that aren't able to be their true selves uh, or forcing themselves to fit in. Question nine, why do you think people hide a disability? So a whole range is 85% because it's an impact on career, 57% saying bullying, so that's one in two. Uh, fear of bullying, 77% um, saying being excluded, 88% treated unfavourably, 77% decreased chances on getting a job and 79% experienced discrimination. So a huge range there um, of why um, we believe people are hiding a disability. And I guess these results mean that is why people hide a disability. Question 10. Should neurodivergent employees fit into the working environment or should the working environment fit around employees so they can thrive? So 4% think employees should fit into the working environment, but this is what's expected. And a fantastic 86% say the work environment should fit around the employees. Um, and then 5% uh, say not sure and 5% other. So, um, which might might be uh, but both, but eighty six six percent saying the work environment should fit around the employees, and we need more of this, and it's something we will look at going forward. Question eleven: How does your organisation support neurodiverse colleagues? So, uh, very little twenty three percent, well thirty eight percent, great deal eighteen percent. So, well and a great deal is fifty six percent, and then there's twenty one percent saying not sure. Do you think neurodiverse employees in your organization experience disadvantage? 39% saying yes. And then 13% uh, saying not, no. And 46% saying not sure. So if we remove the not sures, then it's actually 72% believe neurodiverse employees 
in their organization are experiencing disadvantage because again quite often with people masking it or not sharing it or we're not seeing it uh, that's why we come into the not sure category so thank you all for contributing to that and we will share the results with you okay on to the next bit of today's event thank you all for that okay so um the Right, from one poll to another, but this next poll takes you 10 seconds, okay? So just one quick question. So in a team of around 100 employees, how many are most likely neurodivergent or neurodiverse in a team of 100 employees? Okay, so the, I'll share the results, so if you can all see that. So it's quite a mix, 40% uh, saying 11 to 20 uh, people, uh, and then uh, equals 6 to 10 or 21, 25. So, um, in the UK, it's one in seven people are neuro neurodiverse in the UK. Um, so according to that, that'll be 14 people uh, will be neurodiverse in the organisation. So just, that's, a, that's a crude uh, way of um, thinking. But I just want us to think about that, that mind. So in 100 people in your office or your, your workplaces, let's say 14 are um, neuro, neurodiverse. Okay. So what, what we um, can we just show a, a video which explains what neurodiversity is? So this is affecting at least Just 14 like of your our people. Just like fingerprints, all our brains are unique. But for the majority of people, their brains are similar enough that there are largely no obvious differences in how they function. They have differences in things like skills, preferences and styles. But mostly, their brains mean they perceive the world in the same way. But for others, their brains are more fundamentally different. They have differences in things like social understanding, sensory processing, communication and information processing. These differences are a result of neurological differences such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia and more. This natural variation in our brains is called neurodiversity. Those of us with no neurological conditions are neurotypical, and those of us with neurological conditions are neurodivergent. Neurodivergent people think differently. Their unique perspectives and experiences mean they can often excel at creativity and innovation, have highly specialised skill sets, and an ability to hyperfocus. If embraced, this can be a huge advantage to organisations and society. However, the differences neurodivergent people experience can make life challenging. In order to thrive at work, they often need some simple accommodations. For example, a sensory calm environment to recharge in, or a routine with the same start and end times. Approximately one in seven people are neurodivergent, so not only is embracing neurodiversity critical for a truly inclusive organisation, but it also presents organisations with a huge opportunity. Thank you. That's from just um, Meredith from Differing Minds. So I will, again, you get a link to this video um, after the event as well. What we just thought we'd let you know of some awareness months. So in October, which is where we are now, um, we have ADH, we're in ADHD Awareness Month. It is Dyslexia Awareness Week, and next week is Dyspraxia Awareness Week. Also, we are, we're in the middle of, or just starting Black History Month. It's also Breast Cancer Awareness Month and World Mental Health Day, two um, issues, um, conditions that really affect the community. Next slide, please. Other awareness months to be aware of. So April is Autism Awareness Month, and then there's Neurodiversity Celebration Week in March. And then we're also affecting the community is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month um, in March. Diabetes Awareness Month is in November. And National Heart uh, Month is in February. So these um, conditions really affect the um, ethnically diverse community. So um, please do look at this to support your organ your colleagues as well. Okay. Again, we will share this after the event for you all. Okay. And I know there are more um, awareness things that we haven't included. Next slide, please. As we said today, we are shining a light on the intersectionality of people that are ethnically diverse and neurodiverse. We know it's the impact, the barriers and challenges we face just by the colour of our skin, our accents, our family heritage and just by being different. It's hard, it's tough and often it's unfair. 
but we know most people who are ethnically diverse also experience other challenges just by being different from birth, including the way our minds work. Today, we'll hear from three people who are all neurodiverse and the impact it has on them as children or in the workplace. I hope we can all learn something, be inspired and driven to make sure that we and our colleagues and our organizations help all people who are different to shine. Next slide, please. So just to set the scene, shocking but not unsurprising, some of the challenges. So disabled Black, African, Caribbean, Black, British ethnicity have won the lowest employment race in the UK. So that's 43.2. So by being disabled and Black. People with learning disabilities have only 6% likelihood of achieving paid employment in their lifetime, 6%. And the but, 77% of unemployed autistic people want to work. There's a huge, huge gap there. Next slide, please. Key facts. Them stats, that, them shocking stats I told you are despite, on average, neurodivergent employees do not cost more to manage or train. They do not cost more. However, workplaces with neurodivergent employees can be up to 30% more productive. It's win-win. And as we saw in the poll, 72% do not tell their employer they are neurodiverse because of the experiences people said earlier. Next slide. Some key things uh, that um, affect ethnically diverse and neurodiverse um, uh, employees. So quite often it's late diagnosis, um, especially black um, neurodiverse um, um, uh, people. They get far diagnosed later than any, anybody else. Myths, denial, so, that, so some communities uh, think some of the neurodiverse things are a myth. Sometimes they deny it or there's shame or they um, people can't uh, can't be um, diagnosed or don't, can't admit it in front of their families or communities uh, accordingly. There's also the trauma and bullying. By being a diverse and of ethnically diverse in school, you know, you're going to be picked on for one and or the other. And the same happens in the workplace. Yeah, so it stays with everyone all out. I would say workplace challenges, which you've all shared earlier, you know, you know it, the disadvantage. Next slide. And masking is such a co com common thing. You know, we have to fit in. Um, you know, um, being different is not really accepted in most organizations. Next slide, please. So I'm now I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Melissa Simmons. Um, Melissa, if you can please unmute yourself um, while I introduce you, so, you, you. Melissa is a community network leader for health equity at the Sheffield Health and Social Care NHS Foundation Trust. She is an autism consultant and trainer and the mother of two children with autism. So we're delighted to have um, you join us today, Melissa. So th thank you. Thank you. OK, so first question I'd like to ask is how does being autistic affect you? Well, to get a diagnosis of autism, you have to have difficulties in communication, in um, in, in rigidity. Um, so for me, for instance, my brain is very much like a computer that has to process every interaction, every sight, sound, smell that I've experienced that day. And I can't fall asleep until all of those things have been processed. And then it's almost like my brain's a central processing unit and then it can switch off. So I think that's the best way to explain me. Mm. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's a motor, an engine that doesn't have a chance to stop. So yes, thank you, definitely. Thank you. thank you for sharing that. And so what's the biggest impact of being autistic? Um, for me, it's the effect that it has on my physical and mental health because um, the environments I'm in, aren't supportive of me and my sensory profile so it means it's a constant battle for me to um survive in um environments that aren't conducive to me which has then a detrimental effect on my health and um causes me not to be able to sleep properly because my brain has to process everything before it can switch off so i think that would be um the biggest one um but i have done things like gain um i've got you know i've studied and studied to master's level um in in autism i'm able to um 
have a, a, a really good job where I'm supporting um, the the equity of communities marginalised by race and ethnicity. So although there are difficulties to being autistic, there are also a lot of positives as well. I think Shane, you shared about the battles and the non-conducive environment. I think it depends, as you said, if we're in a conducive environment, it's very different. Absolutely. To one, one that basically completely, dis you know, it's the environment that disables um, people, not people being disabled per se. Definitely. No, th thank you. Um, what are the key things that organisation line managers can do to support? Um, support is, you can support people by asking them questions you can't just meet one autistic person or read about an autistic person and then believe you know it all every person is different and everybody's difficulties and strengths are different so you have to ask how that person needs support and then work with them to put that in place so as an autistic person you're classed as a disabled person and you're entitled to reasonable adjustments under the equality act so that's something that organisations need to be aware of. And for me, I guess I have, I've had the best opportunities to thrive in environments where individuals ask me what I need instead of just putting in blanket adjustments and assuming it's going to work for me. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And how do you think um, your autism um, benefits uh, you or what do you find easier than others? I, I'm, I'm not any good at maths or science. Mm -hmm. That is not my area, but I think in pictures. And so for me, I think I'm really creative in the work that I do and I'm able to think out of the box. Um, I look at things through a different lens and I think that helps me to connect with individuals better, especially in my work where I work with the, the voluntary sector. So I'm working with communities and people from the communities. And um, I think when people have difficulties or maybe English is a second language, actually infographs and things that are done in pictures are a better way of communicating with one another. So that works really well for me and it helps in the profession I'm in. No, brilliant. I, I think a lot of things you said help everybody. And I think as we see now, we've got more of these um, 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 cartoony explainer videos because it, it, you know, with, with voiceover. So it does that. So thank you for sharing that. And just want to acknowledge Sophie put in the chat. Um, yes, women, um, girls are typically diagnosed later than um, men and boys. And I'd, I, um, typically that's because masking and also fitting in and um, being you know less obvious um, uh, through the hiding. So, you know, it definitely um, notes that, Sophie. And thank Absolutely. you so much. Absolutely. And then, sorry, and then, Please, and, then, and then add to that being a, a black woman. Yeah. So, again, there are those um, perceptions mm. of us. And so because of that, we are mm. also even more mm. unlikely to receive a diagnosis mm. of, of autism. Yeah, thank you. And for those that didn't come to our first event of race, and we, we looked at code switching about fitting in and masking, you know, um, being in, in this case, you know, a black woman, but also if you've got um, other um, characteristics, it's even tougher. So thank you so much for joining and sharing, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, now's our first chance to collaborate and a chance to share and learn from each other. So what we'd like you all to do is now go into our first breakout session to share um, some of your thoughts and ideas on the question, the challenges yourself or neurodivergent colleagues, friends and families experience. Yeah. So this is, so in the room, we've got a mixture of people um, um, that um, are, are living it every day uh, personally or um, close ones and, and some people are here to learn. So we're going to go into a breakout to share the challenges faced. Now, I th these breakout sessions are brilliant when as many people go into it, but we also appreciate for some people, they're not comfortable with that. And that's fine to so stay on this side of the, um, the fence, as they say. Okay. Um, uh, again, when you go into the room, um, have your camera on or off, uh, talk or don't talk, um, you know, just do whatever's best for you. But again, it's really good for us to learn from each other. Sam, if we can put possibly, um, 10 or 11 in the room, so uh, say maybe 17 rooms, uh, if that's possible, that'd be great. Um, so just join your room um, and then we're giving you all about sort of six or seven minutes and then we'll come back. OK, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you. So um, um, I think we had about sort of 20 seconds left in my group and I did the ultimate thing, which some people love. You know, we've got 20 seconds left. Does anyone want to say something quickly? <laughs> which I can appreciate. You know, 20% of the audience go. 
<laughs> that's not me at all so uh so uh thank you and we do appreciate this this event is not going to be perfect but we're trying our best um to, to accommodate um everyone's needs what be really helpful is um if in in the chat now if people could just um put put the the, the challenges or the difficulties people experience whether it's yourselves or people you know don't worry about typos don't worry about spellings or, or grammar or anything else like that we'll tidy up after and uh, we'll anonymize it. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll collect this thing. So hopefully it'll be like a nice little um, uh, pack for you to sort of pull together for your organization, saying these are the challenges that people people do. Um, I'll, I'll let you do that. Um, and the more of us that contribute to this, the more sort of um, resource we all have later on, okay? I see 30 in there, can we get up to 50? No, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, there was something that was interesting said in our group which was um you know about taking the onus from the individual to say their needs or fight for their rights it should be the organization um you know sort of helping uh people get what they need and in an easy and pain-free way because everyday challenge um and, and i think people procrastination even just asking for the support you know it could take you a year <laughs> till you get there for that so um so appreciate that so lots of lovely ideas in here so thank you all for sharing that and and for the other people that's um, contributed in the group i was in thank you so next slide please i'm now um please introduce steve park um who um we videoed uh, late last week as he's currently teaching so you, you know um he, he's, he, he's 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 he couldn't get out of the class um steve is a neurodivergent speaker coach and specialist working with adults and children with a background in neuroscience and performance. He also mentioned um, that he's a natural bodybuilder of 38 years. Um, we're, um, we're playing the video of Steve and he starts off by sharing how being an undiagnosed dyslexic affected him as a child. So if we could play the video, that'd be great. Thank you. So how was your life before you were diagnosed, Steve? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, it, it, it was always a challenge because I always knew I was different. I mean, what some people have found at school really easy, like they, they would love English and they would love maths and so on. I would absolutely just dread it because it, it was so foreign to me. I, I, I loved, oddly enough, I love speaking. I love the English language. I love knowing what words mean, you know, sort of the, the, like a, a complex word, what it actually means as opposed to a word people may use in the general vernacular day to day so i'm really interested in that and the language but when it came to writing it down or you know writing a story i found that hugely difficult so those were really really huge challenges i had at school and and automatically we were put into the i mean i guess for one of a better phrase you could call, call it the slow class or whatever um for english and maths everything else that you know i enjoyed maths uh, sorry science pe drama technical drawing, uh, woodwork, all of those kind of things right back in the, um, well, back in the seventies and eighties, really back, back in the school days, I really enjoy. But the thing I knew where I was different was I would literally despise English and maths, but I would love art or I'd love drama or I'd love, um, technical drawing or, or woodwork. And they, they were really easy because they were so creative. So my brain switched on to that and I could, I think, as I may have mentioned to you before, right from when I was a kid, uh, as, a, as a young child, I could see everything in 3D. So I'd be seeing something really simple. And in my brain, I'm looking at it as an exploded diagram. So I could take things apart, put them together again, no problem. But if you asked me to write an English essay or yeah. write a story, I couldn't do it. What was the impact of being ethnically diverse and neurodiverse? In a, in a school of maybe... 150 200 kids probably one of only three black children okay. and, and then maybe one of only five um children from you know different parts of the world you know when you when you extrapolate that um maybe from asia or you know any any other part of the world so it was really in the minority on that basis um so there's that aspect and then being teased because i was back then i was sort of obviously smaller but quite big and, and heavy in that sense. So it's almost like a trifecta of, you could almost pick what you wanted to feed me about to that degree. So it was always having that aspect of being, I guess to a degree, a relatively easy target, but on the flip side, having such a lovely, loving family. And, you know, my mommy and daddy always told me and my sister we could do what we wanted. They always uh, entertained any whim or fancy of, 
any academic or any any event with anything we were interested in they would buy us the equipment they would take us to their classes they would pay for us for that so it was lovely because they, they just taught us there was no there's nothing we couldn't do so in my I grew up and I sort of grew into my skin and I realized okay well this is what I'm good at I'm not good at this I don't know how I'm going to work around that for now but I excel at maths or so I excel at drama or I excel at art and then I just said you know what I'm, I'm just gonna go with what works and so then you know, I ended up from getting maybe a C in English, but getting an A plus in drama. And that's when I said, okay, well, that's my thing. I am good at something. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, we're going to, you know, ride it into the wheels, fall off on that particular subject or those particular subjects. What do you think you excel at compared to people who are neurotypical? Well, so good at that you are in the top 1% of the world, whether that might be art, whether that might be drawing, whether that might be having the ability to take a car engine apart and put it together without any, there is something that you excel at to make you the top 1% in the world. And you may know what that is already, or you may not, but mm-hmm. with all of the the difficulties you have with this, you know, with the new adversity and the challenges, you, you've been given a gift. There's some way along that line, you've been given a gift to be better than essentially anyone else in the world. What kind of support has been useful for you? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm I'm very much a a visual learner um and then also i learned sort of the way i learn is not having it down on paper I, I need to learn on okay this is how it feels to do that job or that role or that activity in real life day to day the little nuances about if i'm going to be interrupted how the weather is my, my where i'm going to be working all of those little factors i need to know how that feels so i can be comfortable with it because it, it, it can be such a difference having it written down on paper that you'll be doing this you da 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 in this room at this time to how it really feels in the reality because the reality may be you're getting interrupted every 20 minutes mm-hmm. the room's not available whatever it might be so that's how i someone else you might be able to say okay Davina, i'm going to call you for a meeting next week at eight o'clock and then you may forget about it until eight o'clock and then you go into that meeting and like okay yeah cool da, da, da. for someone like me you come into meeting at eight o'clock in two weeks time i'm going to be worrying that i've done something wrong so for those two weeks, I'm going to think, what have I done wrong? What trouble I am, am I in? Because they haven't said, oh, it's just a meeting to sort out, to tell you you've got a few more days of annual holiday to take. And, it, you know, for me, I'm like, oh, great. But I would have spent two weeks worrying about that as opposed to somebody else, maybe neurotypical, that'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll put it in my diary and I'll remember on the day itself. Mm-hmm. So it's little nuances like that to give me lots of information, probably give me more information than not to say okay i've got a meeting with you it's just to discuss your annual leave you've got more than you need have a think about what days you want to take off and i can't worry about that because that's a good thing so it's having that that relationship with your line management line manager your colleagues your, your, your overall manager to say okay this is how steve works to get the best out of him it's going to be they might need to know more information he, he might need to know about a particular meeting two weeks in advance so he can process that coming up up and coming and he might need to know why that meeting is happening and what it's about, whereas somebody else just needs to know there's a meeting, just just to keep things straight. So it, it's those little nuances, and part of it is knowing how your own brain works to know what's going to soothe you and make you feel comfortable. But it's also part of the uh, the infrastructure of the working environment or the employer to know what works for you and be able to put it in, into place as well as you know sort of using the um the assistive technology to make life easier as well why do you think people should recruit people with dyslexia but now i love that one because normally it's the other way around you get you know it, it's not a question you ever ask i think it will be the fact that they literally see the world differently like they've, they've had to navigate the world up until the point they're coming to interview with you. So they may be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever. So you're looking at somebody that's managed to navigate a difficult world as it is, even if you're neurotypical, things don't always go sweetly. But these people have had to have all of that, plus navigate the world with this challenge and still pay bills, still get married, still have children, still have a mortgage, you know, cars, MOT, just just everything a, a normal adult has to deal with. And yet they're still able to do it. So they've had to re-engineer their way of existing in the world for those, you know, X amount of decades. Thank you, Steve. So Steve, um, that's Steve's story. So his experiences are, you know, a percentage of other people, but not, um, you know, uh, others may have different experiences. 
they've also di diagnosed with autism and ADHD. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, it um, did great. And one thing he said, and I, I'm, if it's HR people here, give people the questions in advance of interviews. And that's giving it, give it everyone. Do, do, please do that because then you get the, I'm going to say Steve was brilliant there, but we worked with him and get, he, then just ask him the questions on the spot. Okay, thank you. This is this is game show time. So if I had a silver shiny suit, I'd be wearing it now, but I don't. Um, so this is Mythbusters. So just just in your head or on your own piece of paper, you don't have to call it out, or you, you can if, if if you'd like to. So so Mythbusters, or sort of true or false? Next first question, please. Just because someone looks like they're coping, it doesn't mean they're okay. So just because someone looks like they're coping, it doesn't mean they're okay. True or false? And the answer is. <laughs> It's true. Okay. And that's where masking comes in. You can tell by looking at someone that they are autistic. You can tell by looking at someone that they are autistic. True or false, Sam? No, false. But it's a common thing. You know, you do not look autistic. Typically behind closed doors, the mask is removed and emotions are released like opening a shaken bottle of Coke. So once people get home or you know, quiet space, uh, the mask is removed, emotions are released like and uh, like opening a shaken bottle of Coke. Absolutely. Next next question. Superpower. Neurodivent individuals have superpowers. And I've, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in the uh, LinkedIn and social media and this, this month. So, and the answer is, we, we, we were debating that. So, on this one is um, not to be labelled with having superpowers. Now, some people do feel they've got a superpower with with the thing, but what we have to bear in mind is many may have unique or exceptional skills or talents, like Steve mentioned, but like um, Melissa said, but the environment they are in, or how people interact and communicate with them, greatly impacts on their ability to function. So actually, um, there are exceptional skills and talents, but quite often in society or the way we work or the way we're treated means we can't we don't have them next slide please we are all on the spectrum this is an interesting one okay no there is no spectrum so we'll share this slide with you after so basically uh we all have different things ability to communicate a bit to process information i think i saw someone um put in a thing about you know, being in meetings on time um, ability to socialize, uh, organize. So all these things. So we all have different things. Now, neurotypicals may struggle with some of these, but not in such an extreme and debilitating way. So procrastination is a key, key issue that many, many face. So we'll share this slide with you after, but it's really important when people say, oh, we're all on a spectrum some way. You know, that, that's quite um, offensive to, 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 to many, okay? It, um, because um, for most people, this is not debilitating at all. Next slide, please. Diagnosis. Neurodivergence is a lifelong condition from birth. True. So you may not be diagnosed, um, but uh, you know, you, you, you've had it all the time. You're not di neurodivergent until you are diagnosed. Oh, so again, you don't have to be diagnosed to be neurodivergent or neurodiverse. The, the challenges and struggles are always there. Absolutely. And diagnosis is just a confirmation, not a qualification. Yeah, it's just confirming. And I, I know in, in the questions earlier, many people think they might be um, neurodiverse, but not think, you know, you, should, isn't, you know, you still have the difficulties or the challenges uh, and a piece of paper isn't just to say, you know, your life is suddenly different or, you know, you, uh, you're now, you know, that, that label. The label does help for us to understand different things. Next slide, please. Support. Neurodiverse individuals have all have the same support needs. Absolutely not. And I think as Steve said and in our group, you know, one, one, one Steve is one Steve. The next Steve will be very different and different needs. Each person challenges are different, hence the support they need will be different. Next slide. <laughs> oh, that's one. Sorry. Yep. Work adjustments. This is an interesting one. You need to be diagnosed to receive reasonable adjustments and it's expensive. So you need to be diagnosed with a, a, um, a neuro, uh, disability to receive reasonable adjustments and it's expensive. Absolutely not. Uh, next slide. Next one. It is a legal entitlement. Yeah. So whether diagnosed or not diagnosed, if you have challenges, I think so. You know that your challenges are your challenges. You're, you're entitled to reasonable adjustments. Average cost of reasonable adjustments is seventy five pounds. True. It's it, yeah. It's that affordable. So there's no excuse for an organisation not supporting. And you know, it's it's we're all legally entitled to this. Next slide, please. 
is the last one, I think, neurodiversity rate. Since 2020, more people are now neurodivergent. False, absolutely. It's just more people are aware of neurodivergency, hence more people are applying for diagnosis. There is no evidence that there are more people who are just unknown. Okay. And the last one here is um, neurodivergent individuals are loners. No, everyone's different. Some people like their own space and to be on their own, and some people, you know, want to be at the heart of everything. Neurodivergent individuals are all geniuses in technology and maths. No, so again, it's very stereotypical. Um, and like Steve said, you know, um, he, you know, he's he's no good at um the, the math side. Next slide. That's it. Yep, thank you. So we'd just like to play a quick video uh, of someone uh, talking about yeah, their, um, being neurodiverse in the office. You have to give 100% at your job. Okay, I'm giving 100%, but now I'm really burnt out. I used to be the star employee and I would help other people with their tasks too. And now I am so tired that like I can't even show up for work. I'm using up all of my sick days. If you're good at your job, you'll be able to climb the corporate ladder. Um. I'm the best and most qualified person here, but I'm still in an entry level position. And for some reason, people don't seem to like me. And I've noticed that the people that get the promotions aren't even the most qualified people. They're just friends with the people that are making the decisions. You need to be a team player. Yeah, but I'm still trying to figure out like the social dynamics of office small talk. I can't seem to get it right. When I talk to people, I get the hint that I'm giving too much information and that I'm like overbearing. But then when I try to dial it back, I'm told that I'm like cold and distant. So we'll send you that link and uh, she's definitely worth um, following, um, really bringing it all to life. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, Abdullah Shajan. Uh, Abdullah is head of spirit care at the Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust, and he was former co-director at the Centre of Spirituality, Spirituality and Wellbeing in Oxford. And as an advisor to the National Autistic Society, he's a senior leader in the NHS and has served as Iman for over two decades. He's also private practice as an Eastern psychologist and psychotherapist and academic researcher so again he is working so he's kindly shared a video uh, for us thank you how does having adhd and autism affect you i can say this now i think over the years it's really kind of dawned on me that um recognizing the specific things i need for myself and recognizing how i need to be confident about approaching the people i work with um, and relationships, um, how I engage um, in the day to day, you know, um, with people um, and the work um, and, uh, and the things I do. Because, uh, you know, you kind of mask all these years doing what you do, thinking it works. And there's times, you know, you realize it's not work. You have to be honest with yourself. And I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? What is it that I need to look at? What can I do to support myself? What do I need to ask for others to help myself, to help me? What happened to the diagnosis assessment? It was really interesting. The psychologist who took the assessment said, I, I'm sorry to have to tell you, you're autistic and ADHD. And I, I found that profoundly, um, it's a strange thing when somebody says it's a sad thing, when, you know, and I, I was kind of like, well, that was a strange thing to say to somebody you know, who has a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first kind of, oh, I mean, this is the psychologist talking to me and he's younger, you know, kind mm -hmm. of experience. But, um, so there was a, it wasn't, it wasn't a shock, um, but it was also, a sh the shock was how the psychologist approached me about confirming the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. okay. So that was a telling story, as if there was something uh, a miss about being autistic and ADHD. It's given me the confidence to ask what I need to help myself. And that's a huge thing, to have the courage to say, actually, this is not a, a, um, a disability. Um, it is, um, you know, I am unique. So what I need is unique for me. Um, and I have to change the language because, yes, I, I signed the disability. Uh, if there's always a form for unemployment or whatever, I, I always sign it because it's, it's, it's under there, you know. Yeah. So I think that is crucial for me. It's been able for me, it's been 
it's given me the courage and the confidence to say to people, this is this help and support I need to help you get the best of me. How easy was it to let your line manager and colleagues know about your diagnosis? It's not been easy. Um, you know, they, they were all very, initially all very accommodating and say, oh yes, we can support you. Um, and actually, um, they, it's been very dismissive. They don't have they don't have the tools or the place or the right questions, and they assume they can fix you. I mean, the latest episode was, um, I had somebody who said to me, "I can fix you," after going on an open university course, and I was shocked. You know, I was kind of really just uh, kind of made me physically ill. Um, they a lot of workplace employees aren't really ready. Um, I think they are. They want to be compassionate, but I think it's how you express that how you um, show that what your values are in a trust or an organization, um, how you practice it. I think in practice, it's very badly managed in my experience. Do you feel that that is exacerbated by being ethnically diverse as well? I'm from an Asian family, mixed Asian family, mixed, you know, every generation is a mixed race. Mm. Um, we just thought it was normal. You know, the way we express ourselves, the way we, are, you know, we mask, the way we mute, you know, we just, and then you start to realize actually this isn't a typical ordinary individual. This is something quite unique. And I don't know, you know, um, I mean, there's so much research to be done in this area for people from uh, global communities. I like the word global communities. What's been the biggest impact of having ADHD and autism in relation to work for you? I think communication uh, for me, I'm, I'm, I've over the years really simplified my communication. So it's to the point. Now, some people, I always say to them when I first engage with them in terms of emails or communication relationship, that my emails are going to be short and to the point. Before I used to write long emails, just to give an example. And, you know, the message got lost in the email. Mm -hmm. So then I realized actually what's better is to be concise. Mm -hmm. And there was one, HR director um, who really prepared me for an interview for a job for many years back. And she said, what well, you can often say in 10 sentences, you can say in five or three. Mm. You know, that's a skill and you, you have to learn to do that. And I find that really useful both in, you know, in speaking to people, um, if I'm present, if I'm presenting or if I'm writing to people through correspondence. And then actually knowing what works for me in terms of working patterns. Now I have a work, I have a uh, condensed week because I know that actually I need more time um, um, to for myself to recover and to recuperate. So then I have a I work hard over four days. Mm -hmm. So I have a condensed four days. So I work you know nine and a half hours, three days, and whatever it is left remaining mm -hmm. um, on the last day. And then I have a you know three day uh, three day period where I'm not working or I'm doing things. That really has given me strength and courage to say, actually, I'm looking after myself. Mm. Um, so it's, I suppose that is important to recognize what you need. It may be that your organization, your, your you, you know, um, hasn't quite got to the idea that this is a good thing to work with people's um, strengths rather than in terms of giving them the space and the time and the environment. The other thing is the environment. Of course, that's a massive play on me. Um, so I have uh, multiple, multiple over sensitivity, sound, lights, um, no, um, smells. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a diffuser that I use for myself and my own. I mean, I have my own office. I mean, I don't have it now at the moment I'm working from home. But um, I would accommodate the space. So how do you accommodate the space to make it comfortable for you, knowing that you're going to be you know, having moments where it's going to be intense, there's going to be times where it's not intense, but it gives you, you've got to make that space for you. Uh, so it works for you. That's really yeah. important. The support that you said that line managers or organizations should offer, I felt were quite um, strong and quite unique. Wellbeing recovery action plan. What keeps you well? What is that vision of yours? You know, what are the things that your triggers? What are the signs of breakdown? What is it at crisis point? What is it post crisis? And, and, you know, how is that supported through knowledge, support, help, um, your, your networks, what networks support you? It's okay to say you don't know how to help. I think that's the first thing you should say. 
as an organization i'm not you know i don't know how to help you you show us the you know the the path and the and, and the and the road you want us to travel with let's travel on this together to be open is to keep um, an open mind and an open heart is important because um it's giving you an option to have the best possible support to be the best version of you that's how we've got to see it how do we how do we help each other shine you know and if we can do that then you know the label doesn't matter what matters is how do we help you be the best version of you in any given moment however big the organization is the leadership um part should have an ability to coach people um, and they should take that on a serious so that it gives opportunities for people with who are neurodiverse to take a um, opportunity to look at where they are in their role, but also how they bring value into the large organization. And that can really only happen when you have somebody at the very top. People will say to me, oh, well, that can happen with somebody who's your line manager. Well, actually the line manager's role is specific. Somebody who can bring out, who somebody who can recognize what you offer the world and how you go about being the best version of that offering. So if you want to bring in a life coach or somebody, so it's almost bringing in people who can start to say, look, you have all of these talents, but with your neurodiversity, you don't get the chance or opportunity sometimes to recognize this is the skill set, this is what you can do, this is what you're doing, you know, this is what you've done. Often probation is six months or three months, and you're not going to get the, you know, most people come into a job, they're already quite, quite nervous. Neurodiverse, you know, we have, we're going to have breakdowns. We're going to have moments where it's not working for us, you know, and that may come across as this person can't do the job. It's not often that. It's often actually where we've not been confident or courageous enough to say, this is what we need. And yes, it's my new job. So you need more time. You need to spend more time with me. So they should, every organization should implement specifically, specifically for neurodiverse a longer, if it's six months, it should be 12 months. So remind me of the question. You see, there's the ADHD. I've jumped off on a story about Thank myself. You. Thank you. There's, there's, there's a blooper. So um, Melissa and these two videos are, are will all be available for you to use, or, you know, if it's helpful training or showing other people that everyone's different um, on that sense. Right. We're conscious. For, so obviously, this is a neuro um, diverse um, uh, theme, and we know keeping uh, focused, and we get tired uh, during, during long long meetings. So we got we want to do a quick poll of what do you want next okay so if we release the poll sam it's just one quick question so basically what would you prefer in the final section of this event so we've got an animation video 12 fast facts about autism or we can have a breakout you can have either or both okay so as i said we always listen to the community it's close so i'll, I'll end the poll and i'll share the results okay so just to say right so you've decided to go for the 12 fast facts about autism animation video. So that's what we'll do. So we'll show that video. Um, and then um, uh, for those that stay around, we've got um, uh, Jess Meredith has created a Tom te 10 top things, how to support people with ADHD that we will share for everyone that can stay. So if we just do this um, video, that'd be great. Thank you. Unlimited social media from Voxy Mobile is great. It's an advert that to be with us. Sneaker drop? That's my autumn looks. Autism is a neurological developmental condition, which means. Suppose Sam, if you're there. Our brains develop differently, some parts faster and some parts slower. Autism affects every person differently. If you've met one person on the spectrum, you've met one person on the spectrum. It seems everything I do is either too much or not enough or both. Gifts in one area may come with serious challenges in another. Autism is not a linear scale. This is one of the biggest misconceptions. We are not more or less autistic, higher or lower functioning. We are autistic in different ways and each have different support needs. The ASD levels 1, 2 and 3 refer to the level of support a person needs, not their ability to function if this support is in place. 
My special interests mean that I see the world differently. My sensory sensitivities mean I feel the world differently. And the way I think and process information means I connect with the world differently. From a young age, society teaches us that difference is bad, and so for survival, we learn to hide our true selves. Masking, camouflaging, passing. When we appear normal on the outside, it's not because we have ceased to be autistic, it's because we no longer allow you to see it. Having some autistic traits does not make you a little bit autistic. Any more than being sad from time to time makes you a little bit clinically depressed. Equating the two invalidates my experience of trying my whole life to explain my difference to others and not being believed. Autistic people are not the same as each other. What binds us together is the shared experience of being the odd one out. We are every age, every gender, every culture, every profession. Knowing I'm autistic tells you only one thing, that I do not fit into a box, and therefore all your assumptions must be challenged. I learn and grow just like everyone else. So while autism is a lifelong condition, something I was born with and something that will always be a part of me, I'm constantly finding new and better ways to manage life and the challenges it brings. I am more and more myself each day. Autism is not a disease or a psychological issue. Therefore, you can't cure it any more than you can cure being tall or having long arms. That said, autism commonly has co-occurring conditions which may require their own treatment. The message here though is that I am not a broken neurotypical person, I am autistic. It's how my brain is wired, it's weaved through every aspect of my personality and it makes me who I am. Some everyday tasks are difficult or even impossible for me, but there are so many things that I can do that you can't do. So why am I the one with the disability? The answer is simple, because there's more of you and only one of me. Of course I want friends, just not on your terms. Not if it means I'm not allowed to be myself and I can't do the things I like to do. I want friends who will let me be me and love me for it. Being different is not always easy. I get bullied, I get picked last, I get left out, I get asked to leave groups because I'm not a good fit. I can't be like everyone else, even if I wanted to. And it's easy to get very angry at an unfair world but you can make a big difference. You can talk to me, interact with me, let me join in, or let me sit on the sidelines without joining in. Invite me without the pressure to say yes. Don't expect me to be normal, just let me be me and don't ask me to leave. To make the world a better place for autistic people, don't force me to fit in, include me while I'm different. I hope you've enjoyed this video and please share this message as part of Autism Acceptance Month. Thank you, Sam. So um, we'll, we'll share that um, with, with everyone after. I think quite, quite an, a lovely summary. So uh, just to keep you here. So for those that can stay, we're going to give you some bonus content. So this is a top 10 created um, uh, unique ways of um, helping ADH um, uh, colleagues thrive. Okay. So um, what we'd like to do is, is a couple of things. We'll, we'll go to a, a poll, but it, can, can we just put for a minute in the chat, whether it's for yourselves or people you know, the support that people need, yeah? So just in the chat, the support that people need, because again, remember we said it's all everyone individual. So your person A may need different support in person B. So just put this in the chat, write it in the chat. Don't worry about typos. Do bullets if that help for you um, or spellings. We, we, we'll correct it ourselves and we'll anonymize everything. OK, we will collect all this and share it with you all um, next week. OK. So hopefully you can take this to your organizations or share in your organization. This is the support. Um, are we offering this support? What people are finished with just um, I said we will share this. Some, some, some great ones that I saw that coming up was this um, you know, reasonable adjustments passport. Yeah, love the concept. For those that don't know it, you know, you have it, and then you get a new manager, you move teams. It's there. You don't have to go through the whole process again. Um, fantastic. And don't expect someone to be the same every day. Uh, people perform differently. Um, again, um, sort of like um breakout areas or place people can sort of like um decompress, break down information, so not giving it all in one lump sum. Uh, appreciate we have given some today in, in a lump sum, but hopefully you can access everything afterwards and then um break it up for yourselves. Clear time scale deadlines. Yeah, so um. 
do this as quick as you can or as soon as possible doesn't mean anything. It needs to be, is that in five minutes or is that in five days? Uh, freedom and feel safe to discuss. And I think what the um, gentleman in the video said, you know, for, for you know, people to be me type thing. So that's fantastic. So what's really important now, this is the first time we've done neurodiversity um, uh, and intersectionality um, on this theme. Can, can we just go into um, a, a poll, a final poll? And it'd be really good to get your uh, your sense of how this event went and how well we can support you and, and possibly future events. So the poll should be coming up now. If as many as you can fill it out as possible. I appreciate, I think if some of you share in a link, you will only one of you be able to fill the poll out just to let you be aware of that. So there's 11 questions this time. Thank you all for completing the closing poll. So as, um, so 89% of you would recommend today's event to others, 2% saying no, and then 9% saying not sure. So we'd love to hear from, the, especially the not sure's, how we can get into the yes category. So big thank you to our wonderful speakers for making this possible. Question two, did you learn anything new today? So 84% saying yes. So 84, so nearly 9 in 10 of us uh, learned something new today uh, and only 16% saying no. Did you learn and hear things you wouldn't normally have access to? So 82%, so it's fantastic um, to be, yeah, the valuable time you shared with us today. At least, um, you know, we've all uh, learned or got access to something we wouldn't normally do. And did you hear or learn anything that were you? So 74% saying yes, and a further 9% saying yes, if I had authority. So that's 83% in effect saying yes, and only 2% saying no, they did not um, hear or anything they will use. So again, thank you for you all in the breakout session, sharing your thoughts and ideas, and then also to the wonderful speakers. Do you have a greater understanding of how to support people who are neurodivergent? 72% saying yes. 11% um, saying no, and 17% not sure. Question six, if you are neurodiverse, do you think this event was helpful in other people understanding the challenges and support that's needed? So 53% um, yeah, uh, saying not neurodiverse. So if we remove um, that stat, 84% um, us, uh, who are neurodiverse are saying that today's event will help with the understanding. So that's that's brilliant. And less than 1% uh, saying it doesn't. Question seven, do you think today's event helped remove the stigma and negativity about neurodiverse in individuals? 70% saying yes, only 5% saying no, and then 25% saying not sure. And it'd be good to understand, uh, not sure, maybe we don't feel qualified to answer that question um, or other reasons, but 70% saying yes, it helped remove the stigma. Question eight, what topics would be interesting for you to race in series? So uh, more on gender, 40%, more neurodiversity, 48%, social mobility, 45%, uh, being a carer, 29%, LGBTQ+, 46%, disability, 52%, um, scoring high is mental health, 74%, um, and health inequalities, 56%, and access, 30%. So thank you all for completing this survey. And it will help us build the events in the format and the style and on the topics that you need for the future. So a couple of events coming up. So Race Network Leaders and Future Leads event uh, is in November. And uh, get ready for Race Equality Week, which is in February. The Race Equality Week is. Uh, so three months to go events is in November. So we've got two events coming up in November. Uh, we need to say a big thank you to our supporters and, and, and funders to make all this possible. And especially uh, CMS for funding um, this series. Big thank you to us, wonderful speakers, Melissa, Steve, and Abdullah. And again, we'll show you their videos after if that's useful for yourselves. Uh, we offer race quality medicine expertise. So if you'd like us to come and help you or run a, a, one of our solutions or run a workshop, then we're, we're, we're available and it helps fund our work. Really important to us. And as you saw this earlier, so what do you see? Uh, so I'm going to just let you all throw in the chat. What do you see? What is that thing in the white box in the middle? If, if everyone just write in a chat. And I'll tell you the answer. I would say Serena or Serena's close to it. Yeah, great for Matthew. What are these people saying? Uh, okay, depends on where you're standing. Yeah, Helen. So it depends where you're sitting. Okay, so at the moment, we're all sitting in C. So for those that are sitting in C, which we're looking at, it's three. Next slide, please, Sam. If you're sitting in another place, you would see a W. If you see an E, if you're sitting in the other chair, and you'll be seeing an M if you're sitting in the other chair. So this is all about, we all see things from a different angle, different perspective. So what's right for one, these are the same thing, but depending where you're sitting on the table. So it's really important to share uh, with each other. Next slide, please.
So if you can support our work, please um, do make a do donation and, and, and um, take a screenshot of that. Any, any, any amount um, does make a difference to keep us going. And we wanted just to say a big thank you for staying with us. Uh, stick with us. We appreciate for some, this could be, um, obviously those that are hyper-focused, they love it and they want more of this. And for, for others, just, um, you know, sh sh um, we do apologize. We, we weren't able to put breaks in, but we just wanted to keep it going to fit so much in. There was so much more we could have done. Um, so, um, yeah, th thank you all for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for your kind words and all your contributions. And as I said, we will pull everything together. Just bear with us. And we will get it out to you in, in the next couple of weeks, different parts, okay? Um, so thank you, thank you all. And a big thank you to the speakers, as we said. Have a good afternoon.